My name is Steve Williams. I am a engineering expert, buildings and civils in the TA, which is a technical authority part of Network Rail. I've been in the construction game for 35 years now, and boy, does that go quick. Uh, I'm a fellow of the Institution of Structural Engineers and a fellow of the Institution of Civil Engineers and a member of the Permanent Way Institution. Uh, I've had about uh, ooh, 20 odd years in the railway, uh, 14 years working for Network Rail, before that working in the railway as a consultant engineer, working for contractors and, and, and TOX in the main. Um, and prior to that, uh, lots of general structural engineering work. So that's a little bit about my background. What we're going to talk about today is, uh, if I can just, I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping internally, bear with me. Uh, we're going to talk about the Network Rail uh, vision, home safe every day. Uh, we're going to talk about health and safety by design. There's a bit of guidance that's, that Angus has already mentioned. I'll just be going through a few bits and pieces of that guidance. Then we're going to, excuse me. We're going to talk about lessons learned or, or or one could say well have we learned those lessons we'll talk about that in a bit because i'm thinking should we be saying lessons to learn uh, then we'll talk about some showcases for great temporary works engineering there uh, thanks to the the diligent work and the expertise of the supply chain in network rail the vast majority of things we do in network rail are safe are delivered on time and to budget However, some, sometimes things go wrong and it's it's very valuable that the industry learns from lessons uh, and collectively, I, the reason why I'm here today is because I want to help people who are the audience today uh, learn some lessons about things that have gone wrong on, on network rail managed infrastructure. So hopefully you can learn from them and we don't repeat them in the future. Uh, and then some conclusions and thoughts for the future. So let's crack on with the uh, network rail vision, home safe every day. So. Our vision, everyone home safe every day, dead simple to say, not quite as not quite as easy uh, to execute, but really, really important. And, and it, it's a mantra that's been in place for about a decade or more. And we continue to use it and we continue to desire strongly everybody, uh, ourselves, the supply chain, the public, anybody involved in network rail managed infrastructure gets home safe every day. Why is it important? Well, I think the gaffer thinks it's important because he signed the piece of paper, the bottom half of which you see now, you saw the top half in the last slide. And that's, uh, I think we'll be uh, dropping into the chat later on a few links to those people who don't know where to find this stuff. Uh, and you can look at it. Now, there's a lot of words on the slide and you'll see I've got a few picturey slides and a few wordy slides. This is a wordy one, but there's some important things in here. And these are all very important things that this business uh, wants people to take account of and rather than go through them all uh, i understand this this lecture is recorded so you can always pause it and look at it at your leisure and i will be whizzing through because of time some of these slides but i'll draw your attention to two things there uh, just above andrew's signature we will stop work if it cannot be done safely do we uh, and we will personally intervene if we feel the situation or behaviour might be unsafe. I'm a health, uh, um, everyone home safe every day champion and I deliver a four hour course internally to, to the business. And we talk about this because it is really important that as part of safety culture, if we can honour the things that are on that list, uh, we can make the world a safer place. So, Health and safety by design. I'll lead something called health and safety by design buildings and civils working group. And that's a collaborative exercise. A few people from Network Rail. It's uh, it's chaired by really dil diligently by a chap called Andy Barnes from Arcadis. And it's a collaborative forum with consultants, contractors, uh, T1s, T2s, T3s uh, and Network Rail all working collaboratively to improve how we design things safer and as part of that we've got some guidance uh the guidance is from 2019 in 2019 it was up to date but the, you know the, the march of progress means that we are going to be updating this in 2023 all being well with the wind in the sails but in there it's about 60 pages long and there'll be a link afterwards it is designed clearly for railway and it's about the early focus on constructability and temporary works. 
so that we can have an integrated set of permanent works and temporary works so that they so that we as the team know how we're going to get from the start through all the temporary conditions to the end state and that we understand what we need to do to get there. Uh, 60 odd pages, so it's quite a read, but there's a lot of good stuff in there. And I'm just going to draw your attention to a few things. Section six, focus and planning. Lack of focus and planning at an early enough stage uh, leads to late procurement, late submissions, compressed review times, disruption to works, lack of understanding and mistakes. It also leads, leads to late change and poorly managed change, all importing risk. A little bit more of that later. I'll let you read the rest of this at your leisure when you pause the, the recording. Uh, Pay close attention to planning. Section 11, communication of temporary works requirements and design for, for philosophy. It is important that temporary works requirements and their design philosophy are communicated across the many interfaces. In this respect, we've got a controlling mind needed. We need somebody to take a an overall viewpoint of the picture, a bit of a helicopter vision and say, oh, this is where we're starting. This is where we're ending. How are we going to get there? Who do we need to involve? When do we need to involve them? And can we make all the bits and pieces fit? Is the space to provide the temporary works to construct whatever the permanent works designer has, uh, has, has uh, proposed? Is the sequencing right? Is somebody taking an overall view? So it's important, lots of important things in that section. And we make reference to various other sections. We've got a temporary works register. Wouldn't it be nice if early doors during the permanent works design, there's a register produced and we can start thinking about how we're going to get from A to B. So section 13 is about construction sequence as part of the design. Some designs rely on the construction sequence for the design to be valid. And you can read the rest of that. Now, there's a lot of words in there, so you will be reporting for this. But I'm just going to uh, show you Gerard's Cross. Now, Gerard's Cross came from, unfortunately, it was a big event that happened in 2005. Uh, luckily, when this collapsed, there was a live operational railway running, but the train had just left this part of the uh, the line. Uh, we could have had a, a very major catastrophe. Very fortunately, nobody was hurt uh, when this uh, con uh, this uh, sweeping arch under construction collapsed uncontrolled and landed on the railway. Primary reasons at the bottom, and I'm, forgive me, I'm going to have to move that screen again. Uh, the tunnel collapsed because the crown was overloaded and there was insufficient backfill to the size to maintain it. This induced excessive bending moments. But why did that happen? That happened because the sequencing that was clearly defined wasn't followed. Changes were made without uh, going back to the designer. And those changes and a number of uh, contributory factors resulted in the failure. There were warning signs that there was excessive deflection of the uh, structure before it collapsed. Uh, and there's a great bit of new lessons learned. We've got internal lessons learned, unfortunately, I can't share. And there's lot, lots of work being done in this over the years. And I've presented at Health and Safety by Design. Uh, but recently, uh, a, a member of the public has been really tenacious in getting hold of a draft uh, HSC report which goes into some really good detail about the intricacies of why this went wrong and uh, I, I, there, will be, there will be a link posted towards the end of this uh, presentation and you can read that at your leisure and you can say how do the things that happened on this job how do we prevent them happening on our own so let's move on to scaffolding. Lots of good stuff about scaffolding in section 19. Scaffolding is relatively simple. No, actually, you can have some extremely complicated uh, scaffolding. This was a relatively sim simple scaffolding, and it was to, to provide protection against a certain part of the, the, the structure at London Bridge. Unfortunately, it fell over, and very fortunately, nobody got hurt or injured or killed. Uh, why did it fall over? Well, it wasn't designed for wind, but an adjacent part of the site was being opened up and then became open to external pressure. And this was simply, it wasn't designed for it. So this is about sequencing as well. This is about the, the overview. Yeah, I've designed my scaffold for these circumstances, that's fine. But will those circumstances change during the lifetime of the temporary works? And if so, 
have I designed for all the temporary conditions? Uh, they didn't here, and over it went. Uh, another bit of lesson learned. Now, here's, here's another one. Uh, this is to do with working platforms. Now, TWF have issued some really good updates to the temporary work, uh, uh, sorry, the temp temporary platforms guidance. Uh, and here's an example on the left of, I mean, it's been C2C for about 20 odd years. Uh, I used to work down on the LTS line, but anyway, a crane fell over. Luckily, nobody was hurt or killed or injured, but can you imagine the consequences of a line speed train smacking into that structure? Ouch. Uh, and therefore we've got a standard. It's my, uh, I'm not referring to many standards in this presentation. You'll be glad to hear, uh, but there is one reference. It's CIV0063, that uh, was published in 2021. And it helps uh, people who are doing work outside of network rail managed infrastructure, but that can affect network rail uh, managed infrastructure to uh, get things right and, and ensure that our uh, ASPRO engineers uh, get the right information to de-risk the possibility of operations affecting network rail managed infrastructure. Compare that with the uh, the job on the right hand side, which is also in guidance. I think that's actually one of Andon's uh, projects. And here, there was a very careful consideration of the sequencing of the temporary works to build up the land uh, and 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 do the piling, do all the things that they need to do, properly sequenced, properly thought through, properly accepted uh, by uh, Network Rail, so that the works proposed for the adjacent site did not affect Network Rail managed infrastructure. There's some good guidance in the guidance about that. So uh, lessons learned, or, or more, more to the point, lessons to learn. So uh, lots of good stuff in in the guidance in 2009 that was developed over a decade by the supply chain and ourselves that was on its third iteration yet still things happen unfortunately luckily very rarely but when they do they could have poor consequences so it is one gypsy patch lane this is a map failure uh, no nobody got hurt or injured or killed which was nice uh, but it was a very expensive sequence of errors and it temporary works errors that led to uh, a 15 day overrun on a blockade, which proved it to be extremely expensive. And because of what I'm about to say, uh, this is about four and a half thousand tons worth of uh, bridge built offline, uh, reinforced concrete, and then moved by SPMTs to the, uh, the, the site, uh, the, the actual railway uh, during this blockade. Uh, the trial run. Excellent trial run. Uh, unfortunately, if you look at the trial run, this is the right hand side top. Uh, the mat sank about six inches. Now, did, was that a fail or was that a pass? Well, it was considered a pass and uh, they didn't turn the wheels. So as you know, when you're turning wheels on SPMT, the loads are a bit different from when they're just going in a straight line. Uh, but that was declared a pass and then they onwards and upwards they went. Uh, it was a quagmire. You can see that on on the uh, on the right. It was th th those moxies were sponging about a foot up and down as they went over the uh, mat. Apparently, I don't know. I wasn't there. Uh, but you can see it's up to its axles on the left hand side bottom picture. Uh, basically, it sunk into the mud. the The mat was totally it is poorly constructed. The, the risks weren't given consideration and down it went and it took a long time to get it out there. We actually tried to get it out and broke axles and it was a nightmare. Okay, lessons learned, we produced an EAN on that. Subsequently, the lessons learned from the EAN were incorporated in the Temporary Works Forum's guidance on SPMT movements, which I thoroughly recommend to anybody involved in SPMTs. So what went wrong on this job? The execution wasn't in accordance with the design. It was ineffective execution and ineffective assurance of that execution. The DRA got residual ri risks, which were shown on the drawings, but they weren't followed. And design changes were not referred back to the designer. Now at the bottom, you'll see the health and safety by, health and safety by design warning tri triangles that say where it's turning, you need to put a map down. You need to build it in accordance with all the risks that were adequately shown on the drawings in the right hand box, which is obviously too wordy for you to read now. But you can always have a look at it at your leisure when you pause the uh, recording. Uh, but uh, HSC got some guidance on CDM called L153. And in, in 
paragraph 139, amongst other things, it says they should also liaise with the PD throughout the construction phase on matters such as changes to the designs. The designer was never consulted on the changes, i.e., oh, we don't need a mat. We don't need to bother with that. Uh, they weren't even consulted. And can you imagine, as a consultant uh, who's designed some temporary works properly, uh, being asked, uh, what do you think if we uh, if we value engineer this and get rid of the mat, we don't need the mat? What do you think the consultant would have said? Yes, you're right. Uh, but they weren't given the opportunity to say because they weren't asked. So there's a lesson, guys. We need to be collaborative and we need, to, if, if, if there's legitimate reasons why you need to change things on the site, and there will be, then it's a case of going back to the designer and checking that everything's okay before proceeding. Big recommendation, please. Uh, Nine Elms Viaduct. Unfortunately, this happened. Fortunately, it happened on Christmas Day because had it not been on Christmas Day, then there would have been lots of people out sitting, they're standing outside and going about their business at the back of these shop units, which are in underneath the arches. Uh, about 80 or 90 metres of parapet wall and spandrel wall fell off. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, I couldn't run the sequence of the video, but there's various videos on YouTube that you can see showing this happen. And basically, it started where there was a piece of plant. The image on the right is taken from the plant camera. Uh, that overloaded the wall and it literally unzipped all the way along there and you at the, at the top of the drawing you see a couple of people running away as they as they see this this collapsing structure coming towards them at a fair rate of knots uh, so what happened here the plants overloaded the wall however there was in it there, there was insufficient consideration of the effects of the heavy plant loads on the existing structures but also there was inefficient sorry there was insufficient understanding of the condition of the existing structures so look on the top right Okay, so they've done a really good job of removing the buddleia there, haven't they? Except for there's bits of tree sticking into the the uh, the brickwork. Now I'm a structural engineer and I look at that and think, crikey, that's a pile of bricks sitting there. That's not a wall because it, the bond will have been lost because of all the bits of tree growing out of it. Uh, and you can see that because when it collapsed, you can see all the root structure behind the, uh, the, the part of the structure that fell off. Lots of I'm only skimming the surface with what we can learn from any of these in the time available. But there was insufficient coordination between disciplines, not proper consideration given to the loads, and there was insufficient learning from previous occurrences. I say that because something else, exact, almost exactly the same as this happened just a couple of years before. So the lesson here is learn lessons from what happened before so that you can benefit from the experience of others and prevent future reoccurrence. Uh, and another one, scaffold collapse. So here we go. We've been we've had our guidance for a few years now, but uh, in fact, that was iteration three. That health and safety by design guidance has been around a decade. So in August 2021, uh, three people were on that scaffold, and one of them said, "I'm not happy about this scaffold wobbling. I want to go and tell my supervisor." Off he went. And unfortunately, the other two on the scaffold uh, were on the scaffold when it did collapse. Very fortunately, nobody was hurt or injured. But for the grace of God, uh, it fell towards the bridge, which was going to be renewed, and they jumped onto the uh, railway. That saved their lives, because if it had gone the other way, they'd have probably, uh, they wouldn't be able to tell the tale. Why did this happen? Loads of reasons. Another wordy slide coming up, folks. Be warned. Uh, loads of stuff there. All of these are contributory factors. I haven't got time to go through them now, but pause it at your leisure. Uh, all sorts of problems, but primarily, this is my viewpoint, the, there was inadequate time given to design and check and assure and execute the proposals, resulting in people trying to do things on site because they didn't really understand the structural form properly and they were trying to do things that weren't properly shown on the drawings like use turfers and decide how, how much tension do you need to put in a turfer because this is bizarrely designed as a an arch structure with a tie to stop it spreading and so the turfers they just ratcheted them ratcheted them up no 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 load no load uh, designations nobody's saying how much load do you need in there you can imagine it pushing the arch together 
And he was like, it's completely overstressed and over it went. You can imagine it actually wobbling a bit like this because it was so stressed and then just flipping. Uh, lack of lateral stability. By the way, the lateral stability provision wasn't actually in. It wasn't completed. They didn't sign it off to say this is, uh, they didn't give it a permit to load in temporary work speak. And they didn't sign off the form five, which is something in network rail speak, basically saying, is this okay to load? Is this okay? Will it, will it solve? They signed it off saying it's okay for the passage of trains, but for the fact that if it collapsed, we won't go there. Uh, but they hadn't signed it off to say that the structure had been constructed in accordance with design because patently hadn't and over it went. Some lessons learned there, guys. When people are put under immense pressure to deliver because there's an immovable target, then you need to be very, very, very careful that you're not effectively taking shortcuts, which could result in harm. Big lessons learned there, big lessons learned there. Now I'm gonna go back for a second to something that Andrew Haynes signed a piece of paper on. We will stop work if it cannot be done safely and we will personally intervene if we feel the situation or behavior might be unsafe. That, the person who came off the scaffold saying, I'm not happy about this. He shouldn't have actually have done that, should he? He did do it because he thought maybe this is unsafe. What about all the people involved in getting to the stage where there was three blokes on, the, on that on that uh, on that scaffold at four o'clock in the morning? Okay, there were many opportunities for us to say we will stop work if it cannot be done safely, but that didn't happen on this job. Let's be, let me proceed. Honiton Tunnel. This is a fairly recent one, November twenty two. Basically, this was a big washout. A, a, a huge storm came over the site. Uh, there would have been water everywhere anyway. It's a notorious site. But there was a bit of an issue with the temporary works. And the temporary works caused the flood, which caused the temporary works, which you can see in these slides falling towards the railway, to land on the railway. This happened uh, a Monday morning. Luckily, we were on site at the time and the uh, PC had the right procedures in place to make the right calls to stop trains because this was a live, live operational railway and prevented what could have been quite a nasty accident. But luckily, the train was stopped. Uh, it was in the station nearby and the, the driver saw the train, uh, the aspect of the light turn to red. So he stopped. Well, he didn't, he didn't start. Uh, and and luckily, the stone stopped before it had completely piled up over the railway. But you can see it's doing a fairly good job there. And it could have been so much worse. Uh, many people on this call can think of what might have happened should the stone have built up and should have trained hit it at line speed. So what, what actually happened? More imagery. What you see in green are temporary works hall roads that were designed. What you see in orange are temporary works hall roads that weren't designed. In order to meet a, uh, this is under investigation, uh, so the investigation results will come out hopefully in the next few weeks. Uh, but wh where we are at the moment is that the temporary works hall roads which were designed were washed out by a flow of water. There was a bridge over the flume that you can see. Uh, and just above that, they needed to put another hall road in outside the site to get to some temporary works to the upside, which is on the right hand side of this image. And in order to do that, decisions were made on site to put a hall road in and pipe a ditch with some pipes, uh, twin 600 diameter pipes that, that were on site. There was no design. There was no risk assessment. There was no assurance. That backed up during a flooding event. It then forced the water to go in places where it wasn't planned to. And that overwhelmed the the uh, stability of the uh, structure and it washed onto the site. So some a lack of design there and a lack of appreciation of the consequences of the uh, stream being piped and it blocking. Uh, so here we go. It needs to look outside the site boundary for risks, which may affect the safe execution. I'm OK for time at the moment because it will speed up. Uh, temporary works whose presence or failure could affect the railway must be provided with designed and checked temporary works designs and assurance submissions. It's all in our standards, folks. Those of you who work on the railway will know that. 
uh, there wasn't a design or submission for the temporary works. Indeed, the temporary works coordinator uh, made a call. So the temporary works coordinator should have really known what he needed to do in terms of getting his design sorted out. And the people above that person uh, weren't aware of what was going on. Or were they? There were plenty of opportunities to get this right. Uh, unfortunately, that, that wasn't the case. Uh, temporary works which were designed weren't in installed in accordance with the drawings. They didn't actually put in aspects of a uh, perfectly reasonable design. Uh, we don't know why at the moment, but they weren't in there and they could have helped. Uh, in other words, they didn't put drainage in that was shown on the drawings. That would have helped. Whether or not it would have prevented it, I don't know. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a contributory factor. And importantly, and we've touched on this already, is there a defined sequence of construction for all the permanent works and all the temporary works, including how to get from pre-commencement state to handover state? It, it, I believe, from what I've seen, and that's not everything, that that wasn't given adequate consideration. Hence the need to put something in to allow plant to get to a part of the site that wasn't part of any design that was there. So have the risk fully uh, been fully assessed for all the temporary conditions of the permanent works. Nobody risk assessed the uh, consequences of piping a, a stream which was known through the PCI to flood. Uh, but enough of talking about lessons learned. What about some really good engineering? Because the vast majority of engineering that we do is excellent. Here's an example. This was a winner, uh, Western Wales, in 2021. And in a nutshell, this was quite a complex bridge renewal, heavy skew, uh, but very, very constrained site. And if we hadn't have been able to keep that uh, lot, uh, that road open, there would have been a 40 or 45 odd mile diversion needed so this is the team i had some personal involvement in this one this is the team the permanent works designer the temporary works designer a network rail the other stakeholders all working together to facilitate quite a com complex temporary works design you'd say oh it's only retaining wall and a crane but getting what you got there took some doing it took a, a lot of good engineering and they also redesigned the permanent works people also redesigned the permanent works to suit a more efficient and more buildable constructible uh, permanent work solution so that the temporary works and the permanent works people work together intimately to make this a success everything was carefully risk assessed and it was uh, it was deemed safe to have uh, uh, traffic running and fit everything into a constrained site that was an award winner and, and it and, and it went very very well so that's just a really good example of integration of temporary works and permanent works uh, here's another one Wellington box dive uh, dive under box jack uh, this was a you don't often, you see box jacks all the time don't you yeah but you don't see curved box jacks very often if at all i certainly haven't and i've only been in the game for 35 years but what do i know what i do know is that this was an exemplar of the permanent works designers and the temporary works designers thinking about how they were going to do this right from the start to allow again off-site construction to allow the railway to run and then push it into the railway uh, th there's lots of reports on this and there's lots of details and presentations that have been made by the people involved in this project. They're available out there and, and it really is a great showcase of, of temporary works engineering and permanent works engineering coming together to give a solution that was uh, brilliantly executed in my humble view. Uh, and another one here, this is East West Rail. Uh, again, because of various complexities decisions were made and those decisions included a complete integration of the temporary works designs with the permanent works designs in a multidisciplinary way so for instance the 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 small part steel work was designed to be suspended from the uh, the structure and the structure was designed accordingly uh, the i'm going to flip to the next slide great use was made of 
effectively permanent formwork, uh, precast concrete construction, uh, and also integration in that uh, permanent uh, formwork, the abutments, uh, fixings for the temporary works that were needed to facilitate the construction. So again, this is a, an excellent exemplar of the temporary works teams and the permanent works teams working as a team to make this happen. And this particular uh, project saved 70 million uh, compared to the early grip stage or now pace, early grip stage designs that were out there. And this is this is the real advantage of having the time to properly think things through early doors and having enough time to maximise efficiency by having the temporary works people and the permanent works people coming together. And I'm, I'm nearly there, folks. Oops. Raven's Craig. So we had an example of an SPMT getting stuck in the mud. Uh, this is a recent example. It only happened about a month ago. Uh, there'll be lots of stuff coming out on this. Uh, there's already things popping up uh, from, from the people involved in this job. But again, huge amount of temporary works to facilitate a really successful project. And in this case, it was something like over 5,000 tonnes of kit got moved. And those of you who can look at the, uh, the slides will see that it was matted. It was properly engineered. It took lessons learned from Gypsy Patch. It took lessons learned from uh, various temporary works guidance. And it was delivered very successfully. And uh, I applaud the, every person that was involved in that project for bringing it together with having temporary works people and permanent works people coming together to make a successful project. So some conclusions and thoughts of the future. And we've got a little bit of time. Uh, Whoa, I'm not going to read all that out, so don't worry. But that's taken from another bit of uh, uh, another network rail standard. By the way, standards are freely available. Network rail standards are freely available to the supply chain uh, through a link, which I haven't actually given to Andon to put on the site, but I'm more than willing to do so after this meeting. And we've got something called guidance. This is a guidance note on our engineering assurance standard, CIV 03. And in clause nine, we've got some guidance for temporary works. This is a whole load of bullet points, which I'm not gonna go, now, uh, go through now. But this is a consolidation of probably 15 to 20 years worth of learning on the railway for things that people should be doing to facilitate safe and efficient design and execution of works on network rail managed infrastructure and and i if if all of these things are followed with luck with time to do them properly none of the things that i showed you in the lessons to be learned uh, would have happened uh, and and there's lots of other examples of good and there's lots of other examples of bad but i i, I fully endorse these little bullet points as things for people to think about and that, that's uh, most of that actually applies whether or not you're working for a network rail or you're working in temporary works generally it's, it's worth looking at uh, but i'm just going to whiz through my own thoughts for the future uh based on what you've heard today if i can get this thing to work are you sure the brief doesn't leave any gaps and that gaps are resolved rather than assumed as such so temporary works briefs uh the few that i've seen uh have been really good and a few a few of the others that i've seen have been really poor but but do they actually do what is required is the actual temporary works designer challenging the brief and saying well hold on a minute why are you doing why are you asking us to do that why don't you do this and 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 and, and if you look at their recordings there's some brilliant examples of where people have worked together to, to affect solutions that wouldn't have otherwise been possible how do your projects ensure that temporary works are developed to the approve for construction design rather than effectively building at risk because it hasn't necessarily been designed properly yet or it hasn't necessarily been checked properly yet but ah oh, we'll crack on anyway because we've got an immovable target very very risky folks uh wouldn't it be great if we could we could be building to things that are approved for construction has permanent works and temporary work sequencing been fully designed including consideration of all the temporary conditions of the permanent structure uh, as you will be well aware most structures are at the most vulnerable during construction activities and therefore we need to properly think that permanent works designers they've got their duties under the cdm as, as their duty holders and the temporary works designers 
coming together, thinking about how they can do things. And I, I, have we got that sequence there? Have we prescribed a, a, a sequence of, that works? Can it be built? And then can we make use of the contractor's expertise to maybe change that sequence with agreement by the designer to make things more efficient? Next, has all the sequencing been appropriately checked and agreed by all the necessary parties? Pretty fundamental. I've demonstrated why that is. Is there a control in mind? Was there a controlling mind on the things that I've shown you today that went wrong? I'll let you answer that question. Has contingency planning taken place in, in case things don't to go to plan? Uh, are people taking their helicopter view and saying, whoa, hold on a minute, this isn't just this is this, this isn't going right. We need to stop work if it can't be done safely. I'll say that I've said that for the last time, hopefully. Is there appropriate supervision by appropriately experienced persons on your project, including engineering supervision where appropriate? So I haven't talked about lots of examples where this comes in to play, but we need to have adequate supervision and we need appropriate supervision by engineers where things necessitate them. And the engineers on this call will know exactly what I mean by that. Uh, and if things aren't right, are the right people looking at them? Now, I haven't talked about this, but in some of the examples that I've uh, shown you today, non-engineers were making engineering decisions. And that is dangerous because with, with the greatest respect to the non-engineers on this call, if you're not trained in engineering, you are not aware of the consequences of some of the decisions you were that, that are being made that can affect the engineering. Uh, and I think everybody on the call will respect that point. Uh, we need to make sure the right people are looking at things. Uh, are any necessary changes to the design verified by the designer and checked? I think that's really important and demonstrably so with what I've said earlier. Uh, if there are legitimate reasons to change the design, then go back to the designer and re work with them to effect a different solution. That's got to happen, folks, because if we do things at risk, we risk importing harm to the railway. I'm, I'm here to try and stop that happening. Uh, and all are the risks being appropriately assessed and eliminated, mitigated, controlled, so far as is reasonably practical at all times, which, of course, is the law. Uh, and how do you disseminate lessons learned and good practice internally and externally for industry benefit, i.e. all the good work that and 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 doing when you look through that, uh, through, through their library, all the good work that the Temporary Works Forum do when you look through their library, uh, and the reason why I'm speaking to everybody today. Uh, but in different words, how do we foster a culture of continuous, continuous learning without apportioning blame, okay? As far as I'm concerned, everything you see that went wrong on those jobs are my own responsibility, even though I wasn't involved in them. Because I take responsibility for making sure that we get everybody home safe every day. Uh, and so should everybody else. And hopefully, that's the, that's the last but one slide. Uh, what will you do differently moving forwards as a consequence of what, what you've learned today? So Angus said uh, that is that is me done uh, and 